the topic today is open and smart data and are your APIs capable of handling the future changes? So, you know, it's a, it's a massive topic. So I'm not going to uh, pretend to be covering everything in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes uh, on this. And we've got a session afterwards with my colleague, uh, Chathura. Uh, and um, um, we will do our best to cover some of the high level concepts, concerns and things we think uh, people should be thinking about uh as uh, these sort of technologies and approaches evolve uh so first of all um hello uh, i'm christopher davy i'm a senior director of solution architecture at wso2 uh, and i'm sort of working with a lot of our sort of uh, key customer accounts uh, on their sort of integration and api strategies and uh, how to sort of make them the most in, in those spaces um so one of the the key things on the topic of open and smart data it's um, they're the same thing, right? You know, open data, smart data. Uh, there's lots of other terms for data, fast data, big data, uh, data lakes, data streams, lots of different terms. And there's a, you know, there, there, there's sometimes some confusion about what people mean. And there will always be some level of confusion. It's like saying, you know, I want to go to the cloud. It's, you know, could mean a myriad of things to a myriad of people. Um, but you know, in the sort of space we're looking at now and what we're sort of talking about, um, there's some specific aspects of open and smart data that I want to make sure that we're, we're, we're sort of clear on. So if we look at uh, open data, um, so some of the key aspects of open data is that it's an open license, uh, it's accessible and it's shareable. Um, there's no restrictions in its use. So these are data sets that people can get access to, they can use them, they can use them commercially, they can use them personally, uh, and they can do whatever they like with the data um, uh, in, in uh, yeah, say in a commercial or a, a personal sense. And there's no limitations on the use of that data. That, that is sort of some key fundamentals of open data. Um, in some of the sort of uh, descriptions I've seen, free also comes up. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. It depends on where the data is coming from and, you know, whether there's charges because of the, the, the cost to sort of host and maintain and produce that data and keep it updated. You know, that's one aspect that's a little bit iffy, but there's a lot of uh, free data sets out there as well. Um, and some of the, you know, accessible data, what does that actually mean? You know, if you fill in 500 forms and wait six weeks, is that open data? Arguably not. Um, you want to be able to get it quickly and easily and up to date. You know, that sort of process doesn't give you the, the, the sort of abilities and uh, benefits that you're looking for uh, in, this, uh, in this space. Uh, and does it have to be, you know, machine readable? What's the format of the data? You know, there's a lot of data that's available in, uh, you know, PDFs or uh, other formats that are harder to interpret and utilize and analyze um, although there are processes and, and, and capabilities for doing so, but it's not in a, you know, an easily, necessarily easily consumable and uh, accessible form that can be pulled into the right systems and processes and analytics to, to, to do stuff with it. Um, so, you know, the, the, these are sort of some of the considerations, but the main thing is you can access it, uh, you can share it, you can do whatever you like with it. So, as I said, there's plenty of different uh, data sources out there. You've got Google Trends is an open data source. You can just go and get whatever information you like. Lots of governments around the world uh, expose various national statistics and data sources in an open data manner so you can get them very easily. And it's not necessarily, you know, like the UK Freedom of Information Act where it can take some time to get that information. There's data sets that are available now to download and use. You've got organisations like the World Health Organisation. You can get uh, raw data files on various um, points of information that you can sort of download and utilize yourself. Uh, you've also got, uh, you know, um, various uh, you know, companies and organizations, you know, Transport for London have got a great API providing lots of information for, uh, for people to, to utilize around uh, transport aspects, uh, journey times, occupancies, um, accident stats, etc. as you can see uh, on the screenshot there, you know, other governments, as I mentioned, you have Twitter, you can get free, uh, free data, they do have some premium uh, data sets as well, uh, which would uh, cost. 
Um, and another one I thought was worth mentioning is the sort of API catalog from the Government Digital Services. Uh, GGS have done a great job in pulling together um, a set of information and APIs where you can easily sort of search and access and see what various government departments are exposing. And these are exposing them via API. So that sort of accessibility aspect is, uh, is, is very good. Um, not all of them are open data. I will say that there some of them are for for specific uses or you know specific interactions with government departments but there are definitely some open data open data sets on there um so one more little word of of caution on on open data do check the license a lot of them do have open data uh, licenses or uh, uh, data license attached uh, and as you can see in this open government license, you know, you're free to copy, publish, distribute, you're free to adapt to the information and exploit it for commercial and non-commercial use. That's great. But generally, there are also other caveats in the use of that data. So if you're bringing that into your organization and utilizing it, uh, you've got to make sure you understand the terms and conditions uh, of, of how you're going to do that. It's not just like clicking through on your website and going, yeah, I'll accept that because I want to want to get it. Um, you know, you do need to uh, have some caution. So do, do be aware of that. So that's sort of open data, but that's, you know, gives us the data, but what makes it smart? So, you know, this is where, you know, open the, 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 the sort of the terms, uh, you know, can get confused. Smart data is about, you know, having that data and applying some intelligence to it. So, you know, you can have that raw data and you can have it sitting in your estate and it's uh, all very good. And, you know, you're taking up terabytes, petabytes of storage. But if you're not doing anything with it, it's pretty dumb. It's just sitting there. It's not 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 achieving anything. It's not adding any value. So you've got to do that sort of analysis. You've got to put it in context. You've got to pull those data sets together uh, with the goal of making uh, those, you know, uh, using it to make decisions or gaining some particular insights or sharing those insights with others, creating new data sets that are more relevant to other people that you might want to expose or sell or, uh, um, or open as another sort of open, open data source. So that's where the real uh, sort of difference sort of comes is, you know, the smart data is you're using data now. The other aspect of this is it's smart data doesn't necessarily mean you're just doing it on open data. Smart data is on any data source. If you take, uh, you know, a lot of the smart data initiatives, they're focused on consumer data. So it's personal data. So it's definitely not open. You know, you, you know my, my banking information is not an open data set. I'm not going to expose an API and broadcast that to the world free to use. <laughs> and I don't think there's many people in the world that will want to do that. There's some people we might like to see that from. Uh, but we're definitely not going to uh, expose that. But, you know, the, that's still potentially a candidate for smart data uh, in the right context, mixed with the right data sets um, to sort of gain those insights and uh, analysis. So hopefully that gives you uh, a, a little bit of the, 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 the distinctions. As I say, there's, there's tons of discussions online on, on, on this stuff. Um, but um, to me, they're the sort of the key aspects to, to make sure we understand what we're talking about. So who wants smart data? Uh, yeah, as I've said here, the, the bottom line is everyone because you know, the idea of this is for benefit, it's for value, it's for doing something good. You know, we've got initiatives and approaches in you know, every industry vertical, finance, energy, telecoms, et cetera. Uh, there's more here. I'm not, you know, this isn't an exhaustive list here. And they're very broad groups. You know, you've got transport, you've got healthcare, you've got all sorts of aspects where it's looking to sort of utilize the data sets that they've got, utilize the data sets that the companies and organizations within that space have and how to get better value and um, better insights and better services from, you know. So that's the sort of the, the, the key thing here is it, it, it affects everything. It's, you know, there's no sort of boundary to these sort of initiatives. Uh, and as I said, you know, there's a huge wealth of information on each of these sort of aspects. And they're all sort of moving along at their own uh, own pace. So, you know, I've had some brilliant discussions at the sort of Tech UK working groups, which I attend, uh, where you've got different industries and different uh, technology vendors and government bodies coming and having discussions and presentations on, you know, what this means in, in their different sectors. And it's a brilliant way to get involved in these initiatives and start to understand a bit more on, you know, how this is potentially going to affect 
the way we work, the way we live uh, sort of later on uh, and as these, uh, as these things develop. So um, the, the UK government, you know, we've got the national data strategy and that's kicked off the smart data working group um, from their <coughs> spring report 2021. Uh, they, you know, there's a, again, huge amount of information. I'm not going to go through it here, but they sort of over, uh, gave an overview of a few of the, the current schemes. As I said, this is not an exhaustive list. It doesn't cover things like the open transport, open health care aspects, uh, and there's many more um, going on. Um, but these are sort of some of the key uh, sort of smart data schemes that are, are um, in progress at the moment. Obviously, most people should be familiar with open banking. We can go into a little bit more detail on that in a sec. We've got the uh, expansion on that, which is open finance, pensions dashboard. We've got open communication schemes um, and my data in the sort of the energy sector. So a lot of these schemes are very focused on the consumer and consumer use cases. And they're very focused on giving better provisions to end users, uh, growing an ecosystem, creating competition, creating innovation um, but you know yeah, these are you know these are schemes that are growing and there's many more coming along so if we look a bit at um, you know what open banking has done so this is where you know third-party providers can use your banking information that you've graciously given your consent uh, for them to access uh, across multiple banks and services and they can do all sorts of good stuff for you give you better offers and deals and whatnot um, so open banking obviously was a regulatory approach. The PSD2 compliance means that the banks have to expose certain data via APIs to certain standards with certain processes. <coughs> with uh, the central uh, in the UK, uh, there's the OBIE, which is sort of looking after the sort of standards and approaches in that space. But if we look at what's actually been achieved um, recently, you know, the sort of output. So there's a impact report that's available online. Um, and some of the sort of aspects there that, you know, 109 firms went live with open banking enabled products. Um, there was uh, growth, 76% um, uh, growth between December 2019 and 2020. Um, different aspects of, of the benefits that can be gained from this smart data approach um, were delivered by um, different firms. So if we uh, look at that in a bit more detail. The sort of areas where we're seeing impact from the open banking APIs is services that are improving people's financial decision making. So getting a better overview of your uh, <coughs> your um, uh, your finances and your different accounts, um, increased access to advice and guidance, better borrowing because people have more data about your financial situation. Uh, again, similar for savings and investments. So all of these aspects were driven because of the availability of that data and someone taking that data and using it in a smart way to sort of gain those insights and provide new systems and services to people. And if you look at the sort of uptake, um, you know, between 2019 and 2020, there's a 450% growth in the number of API calls. Uh, so that's uh, 1.2 billion to 5.8 billion uh, calls um, uh, between the two years. Um, and that's continuing to grow. Uh, the latest stats that you can get from uh, the Open Banking um, uh, OBIE website on API performance are showing there's over <coughs> 840 million uh, successful API calls in May this year. And that's just increasing month on month on month. Um, so you can see the sort of the, the, the take up uh, and um, interest that we've got uh, in this in, in this space. So one other um, interesting article I came across, and it's a bit of an older case study, uh, and it was entitled How Open Data Saved Canada 3.2 Billion. Um, so it says open data, but again, you know, it wouldn't have saved many money had someone not analyzed it and got some insight and, uh, and looked at it. So, you know, that's the sort of smart data approach. Um, and this is all the, the details are available uh, in the link. 
but you know the core thing that sort of ca- jumped out at me is one of the quotes they gave is given enough eyeballs all bugs are shallow which is a sort of computer uh, quote uh, from Linus's law uh, and they were saying the same could be said about many public policy or corruption issues but that is almost the essence of, of, of smart and open data combined the more people you can get accessing the data and using it and looking at it the more innovation and the more issues that can be solved. Yes, you can identify corruption and, and uh, fraud, but that's a, a you know slightly different angle. I was sort of thinking, you know, this is you know this is sort of key to the the, the drives in this sort of uh, data space. On, you know, the more people can innovate and the more people can utilize it, the better value that you're going to get. Um, and you know, if you're using this in in sort of new business models and stuff, then you know, the, the better services you can potentially provide. So if we look at the sort of use cases that we, we're seeing, as I said, a lot of these are very focused on the sort of end consumer style, style use cases. So we're looking at the hyper personalization, uh, better insights, uh, faster decision making. So, you know, being able to get a loan in minutes rather than weeks where you've got to send paperwork backwards and forwards. People can get direct access to your statement balance, improved customer experience. You know, that's a, that's a key thing. Uh, and that really leads from convenience. You know, it, it's, you know, people like to do things that are convenient. You know, they want to do it quickly. I totally agree with that. You know, I'd much rather uh, do a few clicks online, scan my check and get it in rather than take my checks to the bank. You know, all of those innovations and things make, um, uh, make uh, doing uh, daily tasks a lot easier, which people like. You know, there's new ways of doing market comparisons. One recently I saw around you know, comparing your insurance costs with your neighbours. So they've got some location data, they've got some aggregated data on uh, how much insurance is costing in that that area and are you paying more or less? So are you using a provider that might be giving better deals in that area for some reason? You know, and getting those insights and being able to drive and push those insights to the end uh, end consumers uh, can give you some really good sort of business opportunities in that space. As I said, these are very consumer and consumer driven. Um, there's many more use cases where it's around how businesses can work together and small business and enterprises can make use of this data as well. But a lot of the focus in the sort of uh, <clears throat> the initial schemes is around this personal information and um, making uh, better uh, decisions for, for the public. Now, one of the things that, that did come up, as I said, I've attended a few of the different working groups that Tech UK run and get insights into things like the Open Data Working Group and the Interoperability Working Group for Healthcare. Um, there's some very interesting aspects you get out of that on the fact that, you know, the, the general, there's some general sort of commonalities uh, when you look at this, because when we're looking at open data, we're not looking at particularly one sector, we're looking at impacting lots and lots of different sectors, as I said earlier. Um, you know, and when you look at the the approach, especially in this sort of uh, end customer consumer use case, there's a lot of um, a lot of fundamentals that are the same, or that are going to be very very similar across those sectors. Now, the the trouble is with these sort of initiatives is they might sort of be spinning up in different sectors and going in in, in one direction, uh, and everyone's doing their own thing. Uh, and one of the sort of challenges that we were sort of discussing at one of the groups was, you know, having those commonalities as a sort of cross-cutting, cross-sector sort of standard or approach means that interoperability in the future is going to be a lot easier. Because if people have, uh, you know, if different sectors take different approaches to this, then obviously uh, when you want to bring those together later on, there might be some incompatibilities, which means you're going to have to retrofit something or, or, or or do some more significant changes, which are going to cause more disruption. The earlier you can start to set those standards and stuff is the, 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 the better uh, you can, um, the better you can adapt to, to these sort of uh, challenges. So as I say, you've got some key things here, authentication, verification, that's going to happen, whatever sector, you know, identity is, is key across this. Third part providers getting access, the process for that, you know, whether you're in energy or telecoms or, or finance, again, you've got very similar uh, capabilities there. And, you know, that's just sort of the, a, a few of the aspects to look at that sort of reuse, that uh, cross-sector challenges. There's a number of other things that, you know, have been solved to a certain extent in the existing approaches. But, you know, when you expand this, you're going to have to evolve and adapt 
uh, those approaches to ensure that they can uh, cope with any new requirements coming in. So, you know, we've got regulated or market driven uh, discussions going on because, you know, regulation obviously tends to drive a better set of standards and, and better interoperability. Market driven may not um, uh, allow that to happen in such a, 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 a consistent manner. Uh, but may have other advantages as well as buy-in and, and, and take-up. Um, I've mentioned identity and consent and, and, and cross-sector uh, data sharing. The skills always comes up, and that's one of the things that the sort of report is, uh, the government reports and the government uh, working groups are looking at is, you know, all of these things fall short if we haven't got the people to, to do the work, you know, and that's people to, you know, uh, analyze the data, produce the data, and the skills necessary to be able to share this uh, appropriately. Legal and liability is always a key concern of if you're sharing this data and there's inconsistencies, something goes wrong, where does the liability lie? Uh, there were some great discussions on that back in the uh, sort of uh, open banking uh, days on, on, on uh, the, the working groups there. Um, and then sort of fear and control of the data, you know, People want to hold on to their data. They think it's their crown jewels. They don't want to share. But sometimes you've got to think, can you do more if you loosen your hold on your data, share aspects of it, uh, and let others innovate and use it? So these are, again, some of the considerations you need to be making when you're looking at how best to, to uh, adapt to this. Now that's a, a bit of a whistle stop tour of, of, of the space. Um, you know, as I said, there's tons of information on it, but I've, it's very, uh, very interesting. And there's lots of uh, things to, to look at and lots of initiatives that, you know, could be a value that you need to uh, sort of um, uh, have a more of a dig into. But, you know, uh, as this um, space is, sort of growing and changing and we haven't got the regulations but they're they're coming along and they're being evolved what can you do now to start preparing from this preparing for this so the digital enterprise digital transformation that's been talked about for years um but you know with the advent of uh of, of the modern architectures uh, cloud native technologies um and uh, you know, new cloud services, et cetera. This very old slide that we've used in many uh, WSO2 presentations in the past around the sort of increase and exponential increase in the number of endpoints that you've got to interconnect is just becoming more and more relevant. It's not going away. You know, integration is still uh, a big aspect of that. And one of the keys to that is APIs, you know, the, you know, accessing your cloud services, accessing your microservice, exposing your microservice, all of this is being done in modern um, approaches with APIs. If you look at open banking, it's an API standard, you know, that's uh, what enables the TPPs to have a reasonably uh, standard approach to, to interacting with all of the banks and getting the information they need and not having to reinvent the wheel every time they do so. So APIs are key here. And it's not just about being able to call and access an API and get the data and then use it internally. It's also about being able to uh, expose your own data and services. Uh, if you are sort of accessing external APIs, how do you securely expose them into your organization? So, you know, approaches around having a, a, um, uh, some governance on what uh, APIs that you can pull in. You don't want people willy-nilly to be going and getting any old data source and data set, pulling it into the organization, pushing it into apps and, you know, uh, uh, working with it. You've got to have some control. So exposing those APIs securely within your organization so that your developers and your uh, departments know what they can work with and use are all things you've got to think about. Um, and the key aspect on sort of how to prepare is to have a flexible platform so you know all of these things are changing there's some work done say so you can look at what's been done in open banking as a, as a good example but that is going to change and evolve and if you've got a very static platform that's hard to change that can't uh, react or innovate uh, as these new regulations or new approaches come along you're going to really struggle so you've got to have something that can handle changes in security, identity and consent management, authentication, authorization. 
You've got to be able to integrate your internal external data sources and services. You've got to have that API management so that you can govern uh, how you're exposing or accessing data uh, from third parties. Uh, you've got to look at different approaches to that. So streaming real-time data, you know, you can get some static data sets and just pull them into your data lake and um, look at them in a, uh, in a very um, uh, uh, post-event uh, analytics, or you can be doing stuff real-time with data streams and APIs uh, that are uh, exposing data as it happens. Um, and my colleague will go a bit more into uh, some of the sort of technologies that support that. Um, this isn't just a technical approach, you know, um, APIs need to be part of your business strategy, not just your technical strategy. They aren't just an interface now to expose data that developers need to understand. It's a, a new way of developing your business and exploring new business models of can you expose your data and get more value from it? Can you expose your systems and services? Uh, for others to use that you use internally you know lots of uh, lots of companies are, are looking to do to do that now whether that be payment services or logistics services or you know warehouse <coughs> storage services you know they're things that you can start to sort of expand your business models on and all of that comes down to getting that interoperability um, easily with with apis uh, and as with any transformation you know the the taking account of sort of the agile cloud native scalable architectures is key here. Um, and, you know, having the internal culture to adopt and utilize um, these uh, approaches is, is probably one of the hardest things to achieve, um, but really critical to making sure that, you know, people accept that this is a good way to go, that, you know, they invest in that strategy, they invest in the platform, and that they're ready to uh, adopt, adapt, and, and change as these um, new advantages come on. Um, I think I'm coming to uh, the end of my session. Um, so some key lessons um, that, from my perspective, that I've taken as I've worked with the sort of the open banking space and in the sort of open data space going forward. Um, don't be scared to share the data, you know, compliance to regulation doesn't grow your business. Um, you know, having the ability and the uh, bravery to adopt, test new approaches, expand your, your business is, is, um, is, is really a, a good approach. Uh, build a business strategy around your API is not an IT strategy. That's again, something that you really need to um, uh, need to look at. It's, it is a way of growing your business and doing business in a different way uh, with many different people and expanding your customer base and get those platform fundamentals right. Reliability, flexibility are key. Uh, you've got to be able to adapt and change quickly in a reliable manner. And that's where utilizing, you know, the, the, the sort of more modern uh, agile methodologies and architectures can really, uh, can really help. Um, and finally, um, from, from my perspective, it's going to be really exciting. There's lots, lots of stuff coming. Um, it's a really interesting space. Um, and um, I think it's something that's worth uh, spending some time getting involved, attending some working groups, finding out what's going out there, because there's, there's going to be lots of opportunities that uh, people can use their uh, technical platforms for to uh, take advantage of this smart data. Uh, movement as it goes forward. Um, so uh, with that, um, do remember, please put any questions into the uh, sort of the Q&A and we will look at those. But um, in the interest of time, because I think I've rambled on uh, slightly longer than I was supposed to, uh, which isn't unusual for me, so apologies. I will uh, hand over to uh, my colleague Chithura, who's going to go more into the, uh, the utilization of uh, streaming data. So thank you very much. Jethura, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let me share my Hello. screen first. Uh, okay. Um, so this part of the uh, webinar is all about streaming APIs and how it is uh, related to um, smart data. Uh, so before speaking about smart data or streaming APIs, uh, let's have a look into um, uh, 
the basic requirements for smart data and uh, the, the uh, streaming APIs. So uh, uh, this uh, uh, starts with the user experience basically because uh, enhancing user experience has been become the key to success in modern, modern uh, digital business context. So um, when we uh, speak about uh, building user experiences, basically we have to think about uh, different communities, uh, the behavioral patterns of different communities and uh, demographical differences in different market segments. So this understanding is necessary in order to build uh, or craft um, a better use experience when it comes to delivering uh, digital products. Um, uh, as a strategy, we can welcome the society into our organizational processes or um, into the uh, context um, of the organizational business uh, so that they would uh, kind of become uh, the evangelist for uh, our own businesses. Um, so that is where we uh, think about open uh, data or uh, smart data and streaming APIs. So smart data is all about um, uh, putting consumers in control of their data and enabling innovation. Uh, so this is what uh, I think um, Chris, is, Chris already discussed uh, during his presentation. But um, what really enables this uh, idea itself, because uh, even if we collect information and build them uh, as smart data in our uh, platforms, there should be a way of uh, using this uh, or implementing this idea in order to uh, put data, uh, consumer data uh, into their hands and enable innovation. Um, so when thinking about innovation uh, and building use experience, first of all, uh, we will have to think about enhancing developer experience as well. Because in um, many of the modern businesses, developers have become uh, sort of the evangelist for um, each and every businesses. Uh, for example, if you deliver some deli uh, digital products, um, in the form of APIs or in the form of uh, any um, digital asset. Basically, you need developers to, on, uh, to be onboarded in your business processes and uh, build different use experiences depending on the context that they are coming from. Um, so when enhancing developer experience, basically we have to think about certain things such as uh, smart endpoints, APIs, and uh, platforms such as uh, programmable, programmable clouds. So um, uh, since we are um, discussing about uh, distributed smart endpoints um, in most cases, uh, we, we are mostly focusing on the microservices kind of architectures that are emerging uh, for the time being. So ultimately we would end up with a web of decoupled programs that receive requests, apply some um, certain logic and um, process responses. So that is the uh, structure of modern day capabilities that are distributed across the uh, web. Uh, so what we, what we have to do is we have to build systems in order to choreograph these capabilities accordingly and build different experiences uh, using the existing capabilities that are available. Uh, so th that is where we think about uh, APIs because they kind of uh, allow you to uh, choreograph or integrate these different capabilities from different entities or different um, people. Uh, then you can build them in the form of well-defined APIs using modern uh, API management concepts. And when you think about um, platforms such as programmable cloud platforms, uh, so these are what uh, really enables you to uh, bring APIs and standard endpoints and other digital capabilities into one place and offer them as a business uh, platform so that uh, you would onboard developers in order to innovate uh, based on the exp um, capabilities that you have exposed. Um, so let's um, uh, focus on uh, streaming APIs and how it is related to um, smart data concept. So modern day businesses rely on uh, real time data and they have to be smart data that you can, uh, that someone can innovate on. And uh, mostly um, these businesses are uh, relying on reactive programming models. For example, in this picture, you can see um, this is a bike share app. So these are um, uh, very famous these days. Um, so you can basically use a mobile app in order to unlock uh, a bike 
or scooter uh, which you find on the street so uh, once um, you unlock that bike uh, you can um, ride on it. so that's the uh, basic idea of this business particular uh, this particular business uh, and um, if you think about the interaction uh, between the uh, user and the um, device uh, which is which is the unlocking device of the bike so you, this uh, experience has to be real time so when user uh, unlocks the bike uh, using some sort of, uh, some particular identifier identifier uh, it has to be unlocked real time uh, and uh, there shouldn't be any delays and um, in, in um, earlier ages what we did was um, we send a request from the mobile device um, to any any other um, connecting application and basically we have to check the status and uh, we wait on responses but that doesn't uh, seems to be the best way to handle this kind of uh, use cases because uh, these have to be very responsive and uh, this kind of experiences are engineered um, to act on events of a um, uh, stream of similar events and um, uh, these kind of apps basically should uh, guide users proactively rather than um, waiting or requesting them to um, check the status and uh, verify a lot of things before they actually use the service uh, and uh, because of these modern approaches uh, we have the capability of uh, minimizing the mistakes that uh, could be made by the users and uh, basically we can deliver some enhanced confidence uh, so that they would return to consume your service again and uh, they would become uh, loyal customers. Um, let's talk about streaming APIs and how this um, uh, streaming API model can uh, facilitate your business with the capabilities uh, that we already discussed. So most of these streaming API protocols follow an event-driven architecture. Uh, so modern day streaming APIs are basically HTTP based APIs similar to the REST APIs that you are already familiar with, uh, but um, they still uh, follow event-driven architecture. So this helps providing a real-time update as soon as the events occur, uh, rather, than, um, rather than waiting the client to send uh, an, uh, another series of requests in order to check status. Uh, so that's um, that helps this business model and uh, it helps the helps improving the user experience also uh, and uh, the performance of the applications because user doesn't have to uh, send multiple requests in order to check the status um, of the response that they are supposed to get and because the server doesn't have to handle so many requests that are coming from a certain um, a user uh, the server performance is also getting better because uh, once um, the, the response is ready, uh, the server is allowed to send uh, information to the user in a streaming manner rather than um, initiating that particular response based on a, a certain request. Uh, this enables unidirectional communication instead of uh, periodical poly uh, compared to REST APIs or any other HTTP um, so kind of APIs that you are familiar with uh, because um, uh, server doesn't have to uh, get a request always in order to serve a response uh, rather um, the client initiates a subscription to the server and uh, based on that, uh, the server establishes a communication channel uh, between the, itself and the uh, user application. Then, server, then, then the server is allowed to send uh, events based on uh, the status updates or um, any information that uh, needs to be delivered to the client application. Uh, this interaction between client and the server is less conversational compared to the REST or SOAP-based APIs that we are already familiar with uh, because um, uh, because of the same matter that I just mentioned, the client doesn't have to send a series of requests in order to get series of responses. Uh, so uh, this kind of communication is mostly suitable um, in um, uh, cases where the client must receive data in a known um, format or known schema. Uh, because um, unlike REST APIs, uh, the, the, in this case, the server should know what um, the client is supposed to receive uh, so therefore there should be a, uh, there should be some kind of a schema or format uh, that uh, has been agreed upon uh, because based on that only the server can send events so that uh, the application can handle those events 
um, at the application context. Um, uh, so I wanted to keep this as much as less technical because we have a lot of uh, non-technical uh, people in the audience. But uh, I anyway added a, a simple demonstration so that I could uh, show you uh, streaming APIs in action and uh, you give some idea on how they can be useful uh, in building better experience experiences for your users. Uh, so this example I have even added uh, to my GitHub repository. So if someone is interested in uh, running this or obtaining the source code of it, uh, you can use this URL in order to uh, obtain this. Uh, but before jumping into the demonstration, let me give you a quick uh, overview to what I have done here. So I am using a React.js based application in order to uh, represent the client application uh, in this case. Uh, in order to represent my backend services or backend APIs, I have built a Node.js space uh, API, uh, and uh, I am using a programmable cloud in this case, which is a telco cloud. Uh, so I wanted to get, um, uh, I wanted to deliver some SMS messages. That's the main requirement here. But I don't have to um, communicate with telco operators, so everything is abstracted uh, from this point onward. Uh, so I just have to make a few API calls uh, from my application. Um, so that is where uh, I have uh, sort of become uh, a developer uh, who are using the capabilities exposed by this uh, program cloud. Uh, so first of all, I am initiating um, uh, uh, an uh, events channel between my client application and the server application uh, for obtaining uh, responses in the future. Uh, meanwhile, I'm also invoking uh, an API exposed by this uh, Node.js API, uh, it, a resource exposed by this particular API, uh, so that uh, I would send a uh, message uh, that I need to deliver to a uh, set of mobile numbers. So in this case, I'm using uh, two recipients, two mobile numbers. So this Node.js API uh, communicates with uh, this cloud uh, in order to deliver this message into uh, to uh, deliver, deliver this message uh, to two recipients or two mobile numbers. So everything is handled um, uh, from this point onward using the um, telco APIs. But once um, the message is sent and delivered, I need to send these updates to my client application to keep them um, informed um, about the status of uh, delivery status uh, of this message. Since I'm having two uh, mobile numbers or two recipients in this case, I will have four status updates uh, uh, responses uh, to notify that the message has uh, been sent. And once the client, uh, de uh, the, the message is delivered by the client or, or uh, the intended recipient, uh, it will send two messages for two mobile numbers as well. So from this point onward, I have to deliver these um, updates um, to my client application. Uh, unlike in a risk request response scenario, here what I have done is I have opened a channel and using this channel, um, based on the um, events that this API is getting, the backend API is getting, uh, I am sending uh, the updates real time um, so that uh, the, Re the React.js client application could update uh, its UI. Uh, so that's the idea. And um, even when um, a certain uh, recipient responds to uh, one of these messages, uh, that will also be uh, sent in real time. Uh, so in this um, communication, uh, um, um, in these communications, you don't see any requests uh, that are coming from the client application, only server keeps sending uh, the responses. Here I have used uh, server sent events, which is a type of uh, streaming APIs. And between Node.js API and the Twilio cloud, uh, we are using webhooks. So I'm uh, sort of demonstrating two types of streaming APIs in this demonstration setup. Uh, so let's uh, go to the demo setup. So I have uh, prepared this uh, client application, which uh, represents a um, surgery front desk. Uh, so in this case, I'm trying to uh, send a reminder um, of um, COVID-19 vaccination to um, a set of recipients. So I can uh, use this UI in order to uh, add more recipients. Uh, in this console, you can see there are no any um, responses or requests uh, recorded in the network. 
Uh, let me add another uh, number. So these are some numbers uh, that I already have. So these are valid numbers. Let me uh, add uh, some sort of invalid number as well. So this is something that doesn't exist. Uh, now I'm sending this message to my backend service. So you can see this me uh, message was sent and the first recipient just uh, received the message. Uh, so you can see um, the message is delivered and the second recipient, um, I mean, uh, the, the cloud, Delia cloud has sent the message to the second recipient, but uh, it has not been delivered to this recipient because um, I have uh, put this mobile phone into uh, flight mode. So that is why we don't get the delivered state. Uh, for the uh, invalid number, we are directly getting um, this uh, status update, update call fail. So here you can see uh, the SMS requirement, uh, the, the first, first request that I ha have sent into this particular endpoint called SMS. And the second um, is a collection of events. So you can see I have received uh, multiple updates um, in the form of events uh, using another channel. Uh, let me uh, show you uh, quickly uh, the message that I have got. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, project this into my screen uh, because I don't have the uh, uh, devices in order to do that. Uh, so let me uh, send a response uh, to this uh, application using this mobile number. And in real time, you will see that this is, uh, event was received and it has uh, updated my um, user interface. Now let me um, uh, put my other phone uh, uh, into normal mode from the flight mode so that it would receive uh, the message or the message would be delivered to this particular phone. Once it is delivered, it will uh, update this particular status uh, in real time into uh, delivered. Uh, still, it has not been delivered because of um, the network, the telco network related latencies. Okay, now it has been delivered. Uh, so this is the same message sent to another recipient with uh, their name. So this is the kind of experience that we uh, try to build using uh, streaming APIs. So you can see I have uh, used server sent events here. And in the back end, uh, you will see um, the webhooks, uh, the usage of webhooks between the Twilio programmable cloud and uh, the Node.js um, uh, API that I have built. So if you go to the um, relevant um, um, source code repository, uh, you can even uh, see how this um, webhook related callback URL has been provided. Uh, to the Twilio API. So this is somewhat technical. That's why I don't uh, want to walk you through all the coding here. Uh, if someone is interested, you can uh, use this URL in order to access the source code, uh, which is related to this demo setup. And uh, then uh, let's have a look into uh, the WSO2, um, uh, the, the streaming APIs in the WSO2 context. So basically we can use different WSO2 runtimes in order to complement uh, streaming APIs or complement this uh, prog programmable cloud or um, um, those kind of platform related architectures. Um, so first of all, you can see here we have WSO2 API manager um, um, an API gateway, which allows you to expose the streaming APIs to your client uh, and uh, developers. Uh, so the basic idea is to have um, a modern API management capabilities in front of uh, the streaming API endpoints that you have or uh, that you already have. Uh, for example, um, the demo setup that I just showed you doesn't have any security mechanism uh, implemented there. Uh, you can just uh, send some uh, messages using its use interface, but uh, this is not what you are going to do when you try to expose your capabilities into um, um, uh, capabilities to third parties, 
you have to uh, build some sort of a subscription model in order to secure your APIs and uh, to know who are, who are um, the subscribers or who are using your capabilities. So that is where uh, API management comes into the picture and WSO2 API manager can be used in order to uh, provide uh, API security, uh, throttling kind of capabilities, uh, as well as uh, full API lifecycle management. And um, if you want to integrate your existing systems, such as legacy apps uh, and existing services or uh, messaging channels uh, in the form of um, well-defined um, streaming APIs, you can use these runtimes uh, such as uh, WSO2 streaming integrator and WSO2 micro integrator in order to convert these uh, capabilities into uh, modern um, streaming APIs. And also, uh, without any limitations, you can uh, front your existing microservices and other streaming APIs uh, using uh, a facade of WSO2 API manager, uh, where you can uh, enforce API, uh, ma API management qualities. Uh, API governance and also uh, API analytics related capabilities. Uh, so this is a, um, a screenshot of the user interface of WSO2 API manager. Uh, previously, we only had uh, support for REST API, SOAP APIs, GraphQL and uh, service, uh, sorry, uh, GraphQL. Um, but um, under streaming APIs, we only supported uh, WebSocket. Uh, now we have different uh, types of uh, streaming APIs such as webhook and server sent events, uh, which I just demonstrated using my demo setup. And also, uh, similar to how we define contracts of REST APIs using Swagger or Open API 3 uh, specifications, uh, you can use a sync API specification in order to uh, import um, these sort of APIs into WSO2 API Manager and enforce uh, security throttling, API lifecycle management, and governance kind of capabilities over existing uh, streaming APIs. Uh, yeah, so that's the end of the presentation. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, there's the, the uh, question and answer section. Uh, you can ask any questions if you want. Um, Brilliant. Thanks, Chithura. That was really, uh, really interesting. Um, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, we've got a, a few minutes uh, before the uh, webinar closes. So if anyone's got any more questions, uh, please drop them in the Q&A poll or chat. As we said earlier, we will be making this material um, and the uh, recording available after the webinar uh, if you want to so review or share. And if you have any sort of questions or concerns uh, or you want to know more, uh, then please do uh, head over to our website and, and contact us or send us um, a connection request in LinkedIn or anything like that. And we'll be happy to, uh, happy to talk to you. I'll give it a couple of minutes just in case anyone. Uh... Okay. I think um, if that is all, I can't see any questions coming in. So uh, hopefully that was interesting. Um, it's a exciting area, and um, I, I'm I'm really in, enthusiastic in sort of learning more myself and uh, diving into this. So uh, again, thanks for attending, and um, we'll see you on the uh, the next webinar. Cheers, all. Bye bye.